A passenger tells youth to take over leadership and take control of Nigeria. Well, tonight we discuss choosing the right leader as we gear up for 2023 election. And five worshippers abducted and a priest burned alive in Niger State. This is Cross Politics. I am Mary Annika. Former President Olusegun Obasanjo has called on Nigerian youth to present a united force and take over leadership control of the nation from the older generation. He challenged youths to get together and bring about a truly meaningful change in their lives and that of the nation. The former president, while noting that the older generation of leaders had done their best, advised them to take their, the rest um, and retire as septuagenarians and also as the drumbeat of 2023 general election gets louder various characters are throwing their hats into the ring and moving um, to the rhythm the choice we make in 2023 will substantially determine the future of our country and that of the next generation hence our conversation tonight well joining us to discuss this is jimmy d su he is a public affairs analyst and he's also a journalist thank you so much jimmy for joining us in the studio Mariam, it's a pleasure. I mean, I feel, I feel like we had to call the presidency to get to you to be here today. Abba. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure. It's so good to have you join us. Yes, Mariam, um, are you? When I decided to have this conversation, I was, you know, playing it in my head. Who would be the best person to have this conversation with? But then you came up. My and, name came up. Yes, and then you didn't even hesitate. You said, yes, I'll do it. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, because I oh, I believe that... Um, one owes the nation that has been good to him. I mean, I'm moving towards being an elder statesman, and when you see things going on, I don't think it's rather nice and tidy for those who know to keep quiet, more so when things are going what I would call in the opposite direction. Mm. Um, I'm beginning to think, which I said on my program, the program that I do in a, on, a, on another station, that this election is gradually becoming something like a fast mm. and like a time bomb. Mm. And, and that, that worries me. That, that worries me a lot. And uh, I don't think I need to expatiate on that that much because if you look at the three leading candidates, okay, the three leadings are about, I don't know how many there, 16. But 16 look at that. I can't even remember. I can't name five or six, just the three leading ones. You find that... Um, a disaster could be looming. I can take them one by one. I won't mention their names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. There's one that I am sure can hardly string two sentences together in writing or what is, you ask yourself, so are we going to have a president who will do nothing but delegate? We need a president that is hands down. We need a young president. We need a viral president who is physically fit. I had it to our pastor, it to our Godalo on Saturday on my program, and I was so pleased. Yesterday was one of the best days in recent times for me when I read, I read and then listened to Pastor Tunde Bakari. And I'm glad that people are speaking up. All this nonsense about he will a president will delegate and so on and so forth. We don't want it. The one who is, is somebody is he going to delegate to go to the United Nations to, to, to attend? for state visits and so on and so forth. And everybody's being a child here. All because mainly for selfish reasons. Well, that's one. Mm -hmm. The second one itself also has an albatross around his neck. Okay? He has an albatross around his neck. You ask yourself, with all the questions that are, are unanswered about corruption and things, allegations and so on and so forth, the least we can have of 200 million Nigerians, for God's sake, is to have somebody who is upright. That shouldn't be too difficult, even within the political parties. The previous one that I said, they, I could name one or two people that would have fit the bill for them, rather than this first that we have. The third one is somebody who, okay, everybody looks up to that. He might make the difference. But hey, 
this man is going to go into the presidency without any presence in the National Assembly, both Senate and House of Reps, and I can bet my last dollar is going to go to meet a very extremely hostile civil service. Because over the years, a civil service has changed completely. Buhari didn't win his second whatever in Asso Rock. He lost there. That tells you a lot. And when you hear things like accountant general has this money, that one has that money, you jolly well know what to infer. So any which way you are looking at it, it's it's like we're planting a terrible seed. So so it makes us wonder where do yes. we go? But I want to start by asking. Yes. Do Nigerians really know what kind of leader they need? They don't. Why do you think so? Yes, because okay, you know, by nature of our job, we talk to various people. And they seem, don't seem to have a clear understanding. One video that shows this so clearly, and I'd always said that, is as if the man, you know, I'm just joking, preserve my thoughts. I'd always said that. When this reverend or this priest said in, 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 a, in a church sermon, and he said, look, all of you who know who you are going to vote for, put your hands up, they did. Now, how many of you can vote that the next child that comes to your family, either your child or your grandchild, should be like this particular character. Some started looking for their shoelace. Some were looking for something in their handbag. Some were, and so you can see, you are ready to vote. And these were not just nobodies. You are ready to vote for somebody whose character you can't even emulate. Mm. I mean, look, look at look at the look at our elections. For example, we keep talking about we don't know the father, we don't know the mother. We, he had some case involving drugs. Uh, somebody has accused him of corruption everywhere, and all these dirty things come up. I hear Nigerians think that it don't matter. Mm. That it doesn't matter. It's always about tribalism, about religion, and Mariam, the worst of it all is always about money. Mm. And like Pastor Bakari said. How can you have a leader, for example, who, who has visibly shown that it's about his own self-interest hmm. by saying that it's my turn, you know, and, and look at the various tricks that have gone. Somebody's identity was stolen to make a video, Donald Duke, you know, used for that song without copyright, uh, fake bishops and so on and so forth. You have that, all that on, 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 on one end. On the other side, is the optics don't look too good. But the third loner himself, I worry about him because I wonder, I ask myself, how far can this guy go? You know, how far can he go? Because if you're going to put it down to, to brass tacks, where he comes from is going to be a problem when he becomes president. I support that the next president, if we can, should be from the southeast. That's, there's a politics of that outside. But it's also going to be a problem. It's going to be watched every step. You know, there are going to be various banana pills from the civil service. You know, he's going to have problems even with the politicians in his own party mm. who will be saying that, look, it's reward time. What do we get? So the, the whole thing, I can't say that we are not ready. We've had a lifetime to be ready, ready every four for? years. What are we ready What for? are we ready for? Because that's the question. What we are ready for between you and I is domiciled in each individual and is usually selfish. It's really selfish. We don't understand the issues. I had somebody, uh, you know I'm from Yoruba, I'm from the West. And somebody said, ah, we must vote for that candidate. I said, what does that do to you? Look, see how far, the, how far up the presidency is. What do you gain? And they couldn't understand until I took him through. For example, I, I, I've, I've said that if tomorrow Buba Marwa wants to run for election in Lagos, I'll be his campaign manager. And I'm a Lagosian. But he's not a Lagosian. But he's not, unfortunately. But I'm a Lagosian on both sides, father, mother. I'm just trying to say, we need to be broad-minded. We need to be open-minded. Mara is one of the best governors we've had, had in this state. And if he wants to... I'm just using this as an example. But instead, and we allow these politicians to feed us with all these divisive things. Uh, again, since you're talking about the divisions, because um, I was watching um, Chatham House conversation today with um, Peter Obi, and I really appreciated when somebody asked him that, oh, you're talking about figures and you're talking about how you would do this and do that. Mm. What about the deep-seated problem of divisions, whether it be that of ethnicity or religion? Yes, yes. How do you hope to unite Nigerians and how do you hope to stem the agitations that have been happening? 
And uh, he said, he, he answered, uh, uh, he, I think he said that um, there has to be fairness of sorts across the board, that if you deal yes, with yes, that, if, if. Uh, then you can deal. But, but sincerely, if we have continuously had these problems and every time a leader comes, we ask them a question, they give us something that placates us. But then in reality, nothing is done to blur those lines. Some of the leaders that you have now are not even giving you anything to placate you. They call your bluff. They don't want to talk to you. They determine who they want to talk to. I've never been so insulted as a voter in my country as I have now. I've never seen it. And I'm in my late 60s. Hmm. I've been through, I don't know, think, five or six elections. I've even, I've been more respected under the military hmm. than under this current dispensation that we have. The arrogance. What do you think informs insults. that? What do you think informs the attitude? Well, what, what, what has informed, I think what has informed all this is because most of them know they are not wanted by the electorate. Really? So they want, yes, they want to bully their way through. They want to bully their way through. Look at what is happening in my state. The things that we hear, you force people to rallies, you, you force children to rallies. You do, if you look at the state, you think there's only one party. You can't find the billboard of any other party. Except one of Funcho Duarte, hidden somewhere in Ido. The whole place, water on land on water, you know, is occupied by... And I, I said to myself, this is even worse than under military rule. You know, and everybody has this fear that, oh, I mean, look, look everybody has this fear. I understand from the drivers, for example, the drivers who drive public transport, whether you like it or not, you must put on the cap, you must do this and that. That is not democracy. We are going through a second slavery. We are under siege. And I think that, that worried Tunde Bakari. You need to watch that Tunde Bakari. Uh, it was a, a sermon in his church. Well, I saw it. Yes, and I think that's what worried Bakari, even though he didn't put it in those terms. But I'm going to give it straight. We are under siege. It's like, if you can't take it, that's it. Nobody does that. But our people too, and, and like Tunde Bakari said, they have weaponized poverty. But that's, that's not just in Lagos. Sorry? That's not just in Lagos. It's no, it's not just in Lagos. I'm using Lagos where I am as an example. No, I'm not saying just, in, of course, it's all over the country. The weaponized poverty. Like Pastor Adeboye said, these people you see at these rallies on a weekday, shouldn't they be at work? Hmm. That shows you an army of unemployed people. Hmm. And so they'll go there for the least two or three thousand naira. And then these politicians turn around and show us this crowd as if they came there on their own. Mm. But thank God for the social media. We've seen videos of people, my money, you haven't paid my money. My money is not correct. There was one, they will, they will, I think it was in Emo, and, and it was way late. Only God knows what happened to him. Mm. But I fear for my country. Um, and people still don't understand how you would vote for people in the first instance of questionable character. I can't understand. Let, let's talk about character here. Let's talk about the characteristics of a good leader. Because mm. everybody's saying, oh, it's time for the young people. It's time for youth. But then I don't see somebody like your Uncle Jimmy going to grab a ballot box. I don't see you carrying a machete. It's mm. still the young people. These are the people who, who came to disrupt the uh, NSAS campaigns in different parts of this Lagos mm -hmm. state. So um, do these young people know who they should be picking today, what should be the characteristics that we should all be looking out for? Because as you're saying that we have politicians who have questionable character, there are people who are up in arms for them, blindly. So again, what exactly that's should what, we be looking out for? That's what Pastor Bakare also meant when he said they had weaponized poverty. This is what poverty gives you. In the days of the UPN, the days of the action group, when schooling was free, you think these people don't know when they don't let schools function? You think they don't know what they're doing when they tell you at some point. Don't forget, most politicians are the same. That they take history away from the, uh, from the, from the curriculum. And yes, later now want to bring history back. So they can now write the books. Thank God I'm out of the childbearing age. I don't, well, I don't know if there's a stribulet. You never know what will happen. <laughs> but I shudder to think about the new history books that we are going to see and the histories that will come from it. So you find that the, the, most of them are not educated. They've set their minds. They've weaponized their poverty. And for a little bit of grass and a drink, they'll go on a rampage. But I always ask them, 
They are leaders. One of their leaders, two of his sons, got first class in an American university. All right? What I say to these boys and some of the girls they are in is, look at these people that you want to kill yourselves for and ask how many of them are on the streets like you. That is simple common sense. Even if you say you don't shack now, at least it go clear one day. You should ask yourself, you should tell them, oh God, we will go, but we want your son to lead us. But I have a friend called Captain Blade. He's a security expert. And he called my attention to the fact that something has treated, twisted the mind of the average Nigerian. And I tend to believe him. In modern times, all kinds of things can be done. And I don't even think it's Nigeria alone. I think it's, it's Africa. We always take the wrong side of any stick. Hmm. Yes, we always take the wrong side of any stick. Because the issues, <laughs> the issues are so clear. So very clear. Right from the days when I was in university, in this country, I know what we did and how we determined we were to serve our country because our country served us in the first instance. Our country served us in the first instance. It is a pity that the First Republic, I wish we we'll continue with that culture. Hmm. Maybe we'll have something with a semblance of um, proper at, democracy. At what point do you think we lost all of those values, military. that culture? Military. Hmm. Especially when the footballer was there. Hmm. I leave you to guess who that was. It's yeah. military. Because, because what you had in the culture of the military, they too weaponized poverty in a reverse manner. Universities didn't function well. There were so many breaks in schools and so on and so forth and all kinds of things. Because in any case, to be, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to... Um, they're not academically minded, of course. You would understand that. And they didn't want any form of opposition. And so it started gradually from that point. And what they did was also they were able to give out handouts to, and that's where it all started. It's from that group when they were going to hand over hand over politics, the first set of politicians that emerged were from that group. There was a, a retired police officer who said when it got to, I think it was the Senate way back then, it was a retired DIG. He could recognize so many people of, uh, we don't call them questionable character again, we say of interest. Hmm. Mm, so many people of interest. And I, I don't know who, this election that we are going to have, some people say it will make or break our country. But I think that, sorry, just one second. I think that if that election goes on, it will make or break our country. It might break it. Not necessarily, not necessarily into different parts, but it might break, you, you will be having a completely different country. Hmm. Because the leadership is suspect. I'm not going to come here and sit down and lie. The leadership that we are being given is suspect. Look at one of the parties. You had brilliant minds. You didn't need to go far. You had brilliant minds. Okay? But you went to the fifth grade. So, again, just as you said, we saw all of the top political parties and their conventions, and we saw, like you said, interesting people, people who were brilliant. But then we saw how things turned, whether it be party A or party B. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and a lot of us will say, Oh, but Nigerians are on the side, especially you. You walk on the radio, you hear people call and say, this country is bad. So who are the people who give support to these same kinds of people? Because there are lots of them who come on the radio and wax very lyrical on, on social media. But why don't we see the same action matched with the energy at these be, 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 Because, forward? you see, what we have is the master grand design of propaganda. I tell you this, we know the tricks. You have a Shola, a Bumi, an Akafo, an Aruna, whatever, in the social media is one person. Hmm. You can easily organize one person to handle 30 Twitter accounts in a day. Even more. So what you have is deceit. What you have is real, well-prepared and organized takeover. Hmm. Okay through propaganda and other means. Also through intimidation, direct or indirect. The level of abuse and wrong information out there to discredit people is alarming. Hmm. Okay? 
The question we should then ask ourselves is, where is all this leading to? State capture. Hmm. And it's all for resources. These people, some of these people that we see, we know what they have acquired from the state. Those of them who are like retired governors, we know the kind of pension that they were paying to themselves. Who pays that kind of pension in any country? A house in Lagos, a house in Abuja, at any cost. Car every, every three years. It's state capture. And we can easily see the, 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 some of the things, not all, that have been acquired through their influence. And they do it brazenly. For, for, for a, a president um, like President Buhari, who had continuously run for this office until the first time when he got access, mm. who gave us three things to hold him to, the fight of corruption, the fight against corruption, um, putting an end to Boko Haram, which he recently has pat himself on the back for, and of course, um, unemployment and underemployment. Um, how do you even begin to remedy what's happening under this administration for a a person like you, who also threw your weight behind him. I know yes, I threw, I threw my weight behind him. And uh, like my friend Moody says, he followed my hand. i tell you what it was. We all thought, I'd, known, I'd been following Buhari from his first time. Apparently, it's beginning to appear that he was a dear one that was doing a lot of the things. That is what I tell myself. I could be wrong. But when we supported Buhari then, what we thought, what I thought in my head, and now I agree that I was politically naive in that thinking, was that, okay, he would take issues of security and corruption hands down. And then he had this wonderful professor who was his vice president that could be, could be put to good use. Apparently, it didn't work out that way. There were, there were stories of... The first thing that knocked everything out was his ill health. And when, when you are ill, when you have ill health, both physically and mentally, you suffer. Hmm. And that is why we are, we are saying that at the very least, let the next president we are going to vote for, let him be physically fit. Hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Two of them now are not of the front runners. And how they, you know, they keep spinning that he's okay, he's okay, he's okay. Because there's a theory that says that if you keep telling a lie regularly, at some point people perceive it as the truth. Hmm. How can any reasonable man, any reasonable man, not educated, any reasonable man, no matter, look at some of the, the candidates and say, this is fit, this gentleman is fit to be president. Is it the mental capacity we'll be talking about or the physical ability? It's there for you to see. That's why I don't argue with I don't argue with these people. I know what is a grand design to keep telling you. You have a presidential candidate who somebody has to stand behind him to whisper what he's going to say, and then he even gets it wrong. You know, and the other one soon, not too long ago, joined him. Some of these people should actually retire. At my age now, I can't even take up the job of a, of a, of a local government chairman and do it effectively because I'm old. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, um, there are people who say that the front runners are five. Some would say they're four. But let's leave it at four. Let's start with the Kwan Kwasho, who many people have said, oh, he's smart, he's intelligent, he's above board, he's not necessarily has so much you know, um, corruption attached to him. We also have a Peter Obi. We have an Atiku and we have a Tinubu. Let's start with the Kwan Kwasho. Um, I mean, most people also say, his critics say his powers just end around Kanu and environs, being that, you know, he has the conquest here movement. But what are his chances looking at it? And no, I think that the, unless he stretches his hand across, I think his chances are, are pretty, you know, almost non-existent. I mean, his power base is in the north, I think, in Kanu. I mean, so, and then he has an article to contend with. Hmm. I mean, so, I, I, I don't think he has. But I... I Undercover, I hear that there could be, at some point, some arrangement between himself and Obi if there's a runoff. If there is a runoff. If there is a runoff. So you have the opinion that there might be a runoff. There might be a runoff. Because to get 25% in how many states now? 12, 2, 3. To get 25% in, um, you're supposed to get 25% in 36 states. Yeah. And the FCT. And the FCT. It's going to be a problem hmm. for some of them. Let's talk about Peter Obi. 
Mm. Uh, there's that Peter B phenomenon. That's what it's called. We've seen it on social media, and they yes. also tried to show us in person. And he seems to be the golden child for this election season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but like you had said earlier, on, there are lots of things that you know he's they are they, they are leaving to time and chance, which is the fact that the Labour Party may not have as many candidates. Uh, on the floor of the National Assembly. Assembly yes. um, but even if that were to be the case, looking at Nigeria and what's happening right now and the debt profile that we have and all the problems that we have on every side, even if Obi were to be sent from heaven, can he pull it? Well, he's going to, I said it, uh, it as one I was referring to, that he, he's going to have, first of all, he's the most intellectually endowed of the three. Of the four, that's what I can say. I think mm -hmm. he, he has m ten times much better knowledge than you know the others the other four but he's gonna he doesn't have he's not gonna have not it's not even a majority now he'll have very little presence mm -hmm. in the national assembly and how much can the president do without the support of the national assembly he's going to meet a hostile corrupt reading civil service are you sure that i mean in nigeria you know what what happens when there's a winning party there's also a move of sorts to the, what, he would, what i suspect would happen probably probably if he gets the ticket he'll be able to do something with Atiku because they're quite close and she was a member of the pdp and so if he does that because that could happen because the moment he wins <laughs> the moment he wins the, the you know he has his uh, cousins who are the PDP who they and you know politicians will be scoring around and indeed it will it will get some of the APC people because you can't trust politicians mm. they always tend to move so it was not that it's going to be impossible but it's going to be difficult mm. also with the civil service if you want to, if you know what's going on in the civil service and I don't need to go too far how could anybody have access to it it is something or it or something I mean. What kind of new civil service is that? So they will come against him. Mm. All kinds of things will come against him. But um, let's talk Atiku. Um, former vice president. A lot of people would credit some of the very intelligent technocrats that worked with former president Obasanjo to Atiku Abubakar mm. because he handpicked them. Mm. And many would also point to that as one of the reasons why he should be given a. a, um, a you know, an opportunity at the presidency. But then we've also seen a President Buhari who has tried and tried and tried and, you know, we thought had the best intentions. But what are best, what are intentions if, you know, you can't really act on it? So what are his chances? Who's that? Atiku. Well, I mean, Atiku has a, you never know the way these things would, would uh, go. But I, I, I think that, I, I, and I think very strongly that Atiku is probably in terms of knowledge of governance, uh, put him up front. But the baggage that he carries, that corruption tag, is difficult for me to ignore. Mm. I think Atiku has a wherewithal. I even think he's prepared. He probably would be more prepared than any one of them, but that's not just enough. Also, you have age against him. Then you have credibility. Mm. You want a cred credible president that people would respect. Do you understand what I'm saying? You want a credible group that people would respect. So that makes it a bit, you know. And then, of course, the, you then have the backlash of the issue of the issue of whether the presidency should go to the north again. Uh, yeah. Yes, you can't ignore that and backlash. And the problems within the PDP, yeah. even though it seems like he has moved on away from um, Wiki and the G5 governors. No, those ones, they will soon run back to him. I can assure you, because they, 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 they've been isolated. Hmm. I, I never thought it was a smart move, unless you want to walk away. I never thought it was. And WK himself ironically said that he can't go from where there is malaria to where there is cancer. That's the way he described the APC. <laughs> so the, the, I think they've been isolated. So Fine, finally, let's talk about uh, Tinubu. I know that you've we've talked extensively about these candidates without calling their names, but for Tinubu. Um, We've seen, I would say that this election is mostly regional because we've seen people representing mostly regions as opposed to representing Nigeria. And there seems to be more and more divisions. Recently, Brimo was, um, you know, uh, got a backlash for saying something about the Igbos, and that's because he supports, uh, you know, a Southwest candidate. Um, Tinubu's emergence in the party, how, how divi divided have, have we become 
more under his emergence. Has it affected us one way or the other? Well, his emergence is the party was strictly a cash affair. Hmm. And politicians always think money. Money and position. You know, uh, so, and I had said this at once in Nigeria that please note that the kind of person that the politicians will pick might not be the person that you think will be good for you because generally our politicians don't think of any other person but themselves and their interests. But when we say politicians, they're also normal. I'm talking about primaries. I'm talking about the primaries that produce them. Yeah. It was a political affair. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it might apply to a general election. And I also believe that uh, the people who have been most unfair to Tinobu are the people closest to him. Because you can see that he's not, he's not fit. He's not fit. That amongst all other things, then you have all these other questions on answered. He won't attend debates and so on and so forth. I mean, come on. Hmm. You, you know, I don't, I don't think, I think people but around his campaign him, put it out early enough that he was not going to be doing any interviews or, you know. Well, you, well yes, you, you can say that, but we also have a choice. I'm not going to cast a vote for somebody who doesn't want to talk to me. I felt insulted by that. Hmm. I mean, if you want, you, and if you look at the, most of the, most of the utterances of his party members, it, it is not to encourage voters, it's to show their loyalty to him. Hmm. Even some of his spokespersons, your brief is to bring people into the party. You'll be talking of when the jungle matures. You'll be doing all kinds of things and, and, and showing loyalty to him because you want to position yourself. Hmm. And I look at these things and I smile. They are doing the gentleman himself a disservice. Tinubu is a great man, politically. You can't take that away from him. It would be sad if he goes down in this election in this manner. It would be very, very sad. I have appealed to those who are very, very close to him to say that, okay, oh this, this is just... Even, because even if he becomes president, how is he going to do it? Hmm. Is Nigeria now going to go another eight years of in and out of hospitals and so on and so forth? Oh, they say he will delegate. We are not voting for delegates. We are voting for an executive president. Hmm. Absolutely. Unfortunately, time is not on our side because I think I'm going to bring you back here just before the election so we can talk more. Yeah, uh, but the question still stands, how ready are we for this election? We're not ready. If, it was, if, we, if, if they were to do a poll, if there were to be some kind of poll, do you want this election to go on or not? I'd say I'm not excited about it. I don't think we're... Mm. When I say we're not ready, it has nothing to do with INEC. Mm. But we haven't... Imagine if in this election we were talking of, um, uh, what's the name of the guy, Chidoka? We we're yeah. talking of a Chidoka from PDP and Oshibadu from APC and the Peter will be from Labour. Then you know you're talking issues, you know, it won't be all this. We are not ready. This, this arrangement that we have, if Kia is not taking, is not going to lead us anywhere. Wow. Well, that doesn't paint a very good picture, but Jimmy D.C. is a public affairs analyst and a veteran journalist. It's always a pleasure to have you in this I hate studio. it when I'm called a veteran journalist. It, it makes me feel like a relic. <laughs> it means that you know the business more than you. I think we've got that from some kind of museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Plus Politics. Thank you so much, Jimmy D.C., for yes, being here. Always a pleasure. Yeah. We'll take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be discussing the terrorist attack in Niger State. Stay with us.